Okay, welcome everybody. As we get settled in, you know, I, it's important to make a transition from whatever it is that we were doing prior to doing yoga. And so that's part of the reason why I think it's helpful to um, uh, start with a, a little, a short talk about yoga as far as the philosophical aspects go. So this is one of the reasons I, I like to offer a little, like a, a short, what I'd call a Dharma talk on yoga philosophy or, or yoga spirituality. And thus far over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the yoga sutras about what it means to practice yoga. And of course, we all know that yoga is much bigger than simply doing asanas, but it's a way of it's a way of seeing life. And there are certain hindrances to freedom of mind, mental freedom or freedom of, of being, not just freedom of mind, but freedom in the sense of feeling like, the, the, the freedom to feel like you have some agency over your world, that you have a sense of inner integrity, inner respect, and of course, a love for others. This is this is central to yoga. Yet, if we don't feel that way, which you know, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't always feel like that. So if, if we don't feel like that 100% of the time, it means we have some work to do. We have some homework to do. Or as the yogis say, some om work to do, right? So what's the om work? It's uncovering or noticing noticing these hindrances that prevent us from loving others fully and now what is love what does it mean to love others it's not just oh i love you it's not just what we say with our words but how we live our entire the entirety of our life in such a way that doesn't harm other people and how do we uncover that sense of integrity, that inner integrity, that sense of love of not just others, but love of, of ourselves, deep self-respect? Again, we don't always, we're not always there. So there are certain things that hinder us from, hinder us from seeing that, hindering us from seeing a kind of free, free way of living, free mind, mental freedom, as well as freedom to love freely. And today what I like to talk about is what the sutras call egoism, egoism. The word is asmita, asmita in Sanskrit. Egoism, it says, is the identification, as it were, of the power of the seer with that of the instrument of seeing. Right. So the power of the seer is much larger than this body mind. But we identify that power of the seer with ourself. In other words, we think we're doing the seeing, but really we're just the instrument of seeing. Does that make sense? We're an instrument for seeing. Something lar much larger than us is actually seeing the world. Yet we identify with that. We identify with that thing that is seeing. But we're simply the instrument. And the, the Buddhist way of thinking about the seer, now we can start to maybe stretch over those hips a little bit as we, as we, as we uh, transition here into movement. The Buddhist way of, of talking about this is what is called the eight consciousnesses. From a Buddhist perspective, the mind is made up of eight, what's called eight consciousnesses. And this includes body consciousness. This body is part of the mind. But um, when it comes to this element called ego, ego, Buddhism has a lot to say about egoism. It's not just like, Egoism is not in the sense of like we usually think like that person over there is egoist, egotistical. They think too highly of themselves. Actually, we all 
So egoism is different in, in a Buddhist and a yogic con context. Egoism is referring to that identification with the self, the big self. We think that this small self is the big self. Or another way to say it, another way to think about it is that this small self we identify as our self. It's another way to say it. Right. And in Buddhism, there's a name for that particular, it's a, an aspect of consciousness called, it's kind of a funny name, it's called the lover. <laughs> 